We've been talking about the Christmas we need, and we need a Christmas with a promise that things will not always be this way. And we need a Christmas with proof that God is actually for us. We've talked about that for the last couple weeks, but tonight I want to talk to you about the fact that we need a Christmas with more than one gift. And so uh, this is really, the, of the series, the, the only time that I've used a traditional passage, Christmas passage, to talk about this. And it's Matthew, the first chapter, beginning in verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So technically they weren't married in the sense that we think of marriage, but uh, an arrangement for marriage was considered a binding contract in that day. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And then he gave him the name Jesus. Luke's gospel actually gives us the Christmas story from Mary's point of view. She had said yes to a marriage, though her parents had, may have had more to do with that than, than she did. In that part of the world and in that time of history, arranged marriages were a real thing. And it's easy to assume that in that kind of arrangement, maybe there weren't really any feelings yet. That maybe grows over time. But we actually know that Joseph did have feelings for her. He's a very righteous person, but he also doesn't want to hurt her. That says something. And so he doesn't want to publicly shame or embarrass her. It's interesting in Mary's story, she said yes to Joseph in terms of a marriage proposal, but she also said yes to an angel that would allow her to have a child that was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the angel actually helped Joseph to see how to participate in what God was doing. And, and Joseph was given direction. Go ahead on with the wedding date and, and name the son that you're about to have, Jesus. And, and he will save the, his people from their sins. And, and he will save his people. We all love a good rescue story. When it's on the headlines, we just absolutely love it. For example, on November 2nd, in Turkey, after an earthquake, 65 hours after that quake, there was a three-year-old little girl who was rescued from the rubble. This is what is said in the newspaper. It said a three-year-old girl, her tiny frame wrapped in foil blanket, her face and hair caked with dust, wrapped her small hand around the glove thumb of a rescue worker and looked into his face, wide eyes. Who doesn't love that story? Or October 19, a cruise ship rescues 24 people from a sinking boat off Florida coast. Can you imagine if you're on a boat with 23 other people and it's sinking and the boat that comes by is a, is a cruise ship with no people on it except the crew. That's who rescued them. September 6, about 200 people were rescued by helicopter on a Saturday night after a fast-spreading wildfire trapped them at Mammoth Pool Reservoir in California. I mean, if you're on that boat that's going down, if you're in that forest fire, if you're the parent of a toddler, man, when that rescue comes, that's a really big deal. We like, that. We like the idea. If I'm in danger, if I'm in need, if I'm at risk, then there are people who are courageous and they are brave and they will risk their own life to save someone else's. And we call people like that heroes. That's what we call them. And so God sent his son on a rescue mission. But why did he come to rescue? And this is the thing that we really struggle with in this story. He will save his people from their sins. And trust me, 
when Joseph heard that, he wasn't any more impressed than people today are when they hear that. Because back then, they had a system in their faith to deal with sin. If you felt like you had violated something of your relationship to God, you could bring an animal and there would be a sacrifice and you would go away feeling absolved of that. And so they were under Roman occupation. They were living in poverty. Disease was a real thing. Like they, they, Why doesn't he come and rescue us from Rome? Why doesn't he come and rescue us from poverty? Uh, and, and people think like that today. Why would Jesus come and rescue us from sin? I mean, why doesn't he rescue us from COVID-19? Why doesn't he rescue us from economic challenges? Why doesn't he rescue us from... Why doesn't God do some real work around here? Instead of playing the sin game. Sin doesn't seem all that dangerous. In fact, most people think of sin like this. It is non-conformity to rules. Uh, our culture has a, a long love affair with people who break rules. We've all watched a movie or read a book where the rules were hindering a person's capacity to do their job or to make a difference or to find love, and they decided that that was more important than the rules and the regulations, so they break it. And they're often depicted as their own kind of hero. So why do we need someone to rescue us from sin? It's because we don't really understand sin. It's more contagious than any virus we have spreading globally today. In fact, there's only been one person in all of human history that was not infected with the virus of sin, and that was the one who was miraculously conceived. And it's hard to imagine how much sin impacts our life. We seriously misunderstand sin if we think it's just a breaking of a rule. Sin is a virus that makes us afraid. We're afraid that we're not going to have a good life. We're afraid that we're not going to have good friends. We're afraid we won't get a good education. We're afraid we won't have a good job. We're afraid we won't have good things. Maybe we're unlucky. Maybe the deck is stacked against us. Maybe we're undeserving. We all have to do something that isn't healthy in the hopes that we can get something that will make us happy. And that's what we do. I can stretch the truth, I can break a promise, I, I can take something that I haven't earned or wasn't given to me. And it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, of course, until someone breaks their promise to us or takes something from us. Sin cast doubt on yourself and on your future and on God. Sin creates a double standard. It just basically says that it's okay for me to do this, but not others. Sin doesn't just trick people into doing something. It tricks people into settling for less than what God hoped for them. And it kills real hopes, real dreams, real plans, real marriages, real relationships, real friendships, real potential. We need someone to rescue us from sin. So if you are interested in being rescued for sin, what you discover is that there's a way that God does this. It's basically two things that he does. He gives two gifts. His rescue comes in two, two forms. And gift number one is the gift of forgiveness. Our mistakes have, of the past have a way of trapping us, uh, kind of like the campers in the forest fire or the toddler in the earthquake or, or the, the boat that was sinking. It limits our options and it shortens our lives and it makes us feel worth less. And so, well... Why can't we just forget sin? Sin cannot just be forgotten. It must be forgiven. Forgotten sin feels like injustice. And it tends to get repeated. But forgiven sin? That's amazing. And that requires someone paying a price. And that's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to destroy the world. He didn't come to take vengeance upon sinners. He came to rescue people from their sins. And a lot of people kind of stop with this gift. And it's a really significant gift to have guilt and shame taken off your life. That's not a small deal. But it's not the only gift that our rescuer Jesus offers us. You see, we would not think it was enough. We wouldn't think enough. 
just to protect or provide for the people in dangerous situations. The toddler in the earthquake needs more than a clean face and a warm blanket. The toddler needs to live the life that she was supposed to lead. The campers need to be more than protected from smoke and fire. They need to live the life that they were supposed to have led. The 24 people on the sinking boat need more than a bailout and food. They need the life that they were supposed to live. And this is what Jesus said in John 10. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. It is sin that steals and kills and destroys so much of our life. Jesus has come to save us from our sins. So the first gift is the gift of forgiveness. And the second gift, the second gift is the gift of a full life. A life where you actually receive and enjoy the good gifts God intends for you. A life where potential is something that is increasingly realized day by day. A life where you find courage to act bravely, to live boldly, to love deeply, and to give generously. And we desperately want this kind of life. In fact, we're often willing to do things to settle for less than that. So how does this happen? And it happens by following Jesus. Don't get me wrong, not just watching him and being impressed by the things that he did. It's not just learning his history and being able to pass a test on what he has done. Jesus entered our world in a family that was tired and struggling and afraid, and he's come to enter our world because we're in the same condition. Receive the gift of forgiveness. Trust that the price that Jesus paid for you was enough and then receive the gift of following. So how do you do that? How do you do that? So I'm gonna give you something easy to try. There'll be no test. I'm not gonna follow up and ask you if you did it. But the first is, if you want to be forgiven, all you have to do is accept that gift. It's already being offered. You don't have to do anything. Just receive it. I accept the gift of forgiveness that God offers. And then secondly, start your day with a conversation with God. It doesn't have to be formal. And if there's something you're struggling with or worried about, tell him. Say, I'm heading into work. I don't know if I'm going to have my job when I come home today. I'm concerned about that. Could use your help. He loves to help. But then, just ask him, is there anything you would like me to do today? And then just wait a half a minute and see what comes to your mind. And it is astonishing how in that moment, Jesus leads us through how to live our day. And that's how we find life to the full. We all need Christmas with more than one gift. So now we're going to, to stand and we're going to sing and we're going to light candles. And before you do that, I've got to tell you a little bit of a story about this. We were really worried about the whole candle lighting thing. And it's basically because when you light candles, there's only a couple ways to put those candles out. And one is like that and we didn't want people burning their fingers and the other is to blow it out and and that would mean you have to take your mask off to do that so that was a problem or you try to do it through your mask and i could just see people just kind of combusting all over the building and that's not the christmas we want so so we we spared no expense <laughs> actually we did but <laughs> underneath your seat in addition to your candle are little snuffers this is an ancient technology. And when we get to the end, uh, I'll instruct you, you can snuff your candles and all you have to do is just put this right on top of the candle and it will go out. It's like some kind of strange technology from another world. But if you would all stand with me, they're going to start lighting candles across the room and as they do that, just stand and sing and let's remember that light has come into this dark world and has brought us two amazing gifts.